Hi, thanks for checking out our recording. Um, I'm Jessica, and today I'll be talking about joint work with my advisor, Daniele Nichancho, on simpler statistically assembled private oblivious transfer from cyclotomic integers. Um, so let's start by defining at least a few of those words. Um, oblivious transfer is a uh, core building block for secure multi-party computation. Um, but in this case, we, we only have two parties, um, a sender and a receiver. The sender has given us input two messages, M0 and M1, uh, while the receiver has a single bit of input. Um, oblivious transfer allows the receiver to obtain from the sender the message corresponding to the receiver's bit without needing to reveal its bit to the sender and without learning anything about the other message. An oblivious transfer protocol should satisfy like a, a basic correctness property, uh, which really just says that if an honest receiver and sender engage in the protocol, the receiver should end up with the right message with all but negligible probability. We'll also have security properties for both the sender and the receiver. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, given the title of this talk, uh, we'll be interested specifically in achieving statistical privacy for the sender. Um, this means that no matter what the receiver does in the protocol, the output of the sender is statistically close to a distribution that is independent of one of the messages. Um, in other words, that message is statistically hidden. We also want to ensure computational uh, privacy for the receiver, uh, just to ensure that the receiver's bit, um, that the bit it uses to select M0 or M1, uh, is also hidden. Um, it can't both be statistically hidden, so we'll just have computational uh, privacy for the receiver. Um, statistically sender private oblivious transfer protocols uh, have already been uh, given from a number of assumptions, like decisional Diffie-Hellman and quadratic residuosity. Um, as far as constructions from lattices are concerned, uh, Heikert, Banks, Knife, and Waters gave the first lattice-based oblivious transfer protocol um, that satisfied universal composability security um, by way of a like, brief background that's a, a stronger definition of security than statistical sender privacy, um, but one that also provably requires a trusted setup procedure to be invoked before the first execution of the protocol. Uh, Berkersky and Dotling gave the first lattice-based statistically sender private oblivious transfer protocol, and we take their work as a starting point for our own. Um, subsequent statistically sender private oblivious transfer constructions uh, were given from compressible fully homomorphic encryption schemes. Uh, so one might wonder, like, what remains to be done here on the lattice-based statistically sender private oblivious transfer front? Um, the answer is, of course, to improve efficiency, um, both in terms of computation, and um, but also in terms of communication between the parties. Um, so this, this table here is sort of just like a, a brief side-by-side -side comparison of the, the protocols I um, mentioned above. Um, and so you can see that uh, in this work, we're able to bring down uh, the, the total communication throughout the protocol by uh, at least a factor n log n um, compared to, to other works, uh, and also improve uh, computational efficiency at the, the same time. We follow the lossy encryption approach to constructing oblivious transfer that's been described in, um, I think amongst other places, uh, Pikert, Bankers, Knife, and Waters, uh, as well as uh, Krakarski and Dotling um, in their own, own protocol. And uh, lossy encryption, at least in our context, requires generation of public keys in one of two modes, um, via lossy and lossless. So in the lossless mode, the public key should function essentially as expected. Uh, messages encrypted under it should be decryptable with the corresponding secret key. In the lossy mode, however, encryption with respect to the lossy public key loses information about the message, uh, thus statistically hiding the encrypted message. It should also be the case that lossy and lossless keys are computationally indistinguishable, um, and that one can be efficiently derived from the other. Um, so in our little cartoon here, uh, we can see that we can efficiently acquire a lossy key from a lossless one by just like vertically reflecting it um, and then you know back the other direction by another vertical reflection. Uh, though in this cartoon, I guess they're they're really only computationally indistinguishable if you're like very tired. Um, so just a cartoon. Armed with such a lossy encryption scheme, uh, we can now design statistically sender private oblivious transfer as follows. If the receiver's bit is a zero, it's going to generate a lossless public key, uh, otherwise a lossy key. The sender will encrypt uh, M, uh, its message M0 with respect to the public key, um, and then transform the key into the alternate mode, 
M and encrypt the other message M1 with respect to this key. And both of these encryptions will be sent to the receiver. This way, uh, we know the appropriate message will be decryptable and the unselected message will be statistically hidden. Um, and then the receiver's privacy will just follow from the computational indistinguishability of these keys. Uh, so before we get in like, too much into construction of a lossy encryption uh, scheme, let's introduce some important lattice definitions that we're gonna, gonna be using uh, later on. So first of all, a lattice is a discrete additive subgroup of RM. Uh, so given a basis B, uh, we define a lattice lambda to be the set of all integer linear combinations of these basis vectors, uh, where here we're letting the, the rows of B define the lattice. Um, and every lattice has a unique dual, which is a set of all vectors that map the primal uh, back to the integers. Um, the geometric relationship between the primal and dual lattice will be what we like really lean on in this work though. So I wanna sort of like harp on that a bit uh, with a nice like 2D example borrowed from Oded Regev's course notes. So uh, here our primal lattice is um, dense in, in one dimension, sort of in this like this x-axis direction, but it's sparse in the other, right? In this like y direction. Um, and uh, the dual lattice has, as you can see, sort of like the reciprocal geometry, right? So it's, it's gonna be um, dense in the directions where the primal is sparse and vice versa. It should also be noted that a basis for the dual of a lattice can be efficiently computed uh, from a basis from the primal. So um, maybe given uh, our, our little cartoon of lossy encryption, you can maybe see where we're, we're going with this whole duality thing. Um, so with these definitions, um, we now talk about how we'll approach lossy encryption. So given a basis for lambda, uh, we'll interpret our message as a vector um, and use it to select uh, a lattice point. Uh, we'll then uh, perturb uh, this, this uh, lattice vector with discrete Gaussian noise of parameter sigma. Uh, and this uh, perturbed vector is what we'll return as our encoding. So uh, for fixed noise parameter sigma, uh, a sparse lattice will allow recovery of the message M, uh, at least uh, assuming maybe you have some auxiliary information like a, a short basis for the dual. Um, but if you consider the effect of noise on denser lattices, uh, I mean, these pictures sort of show like the same density, but larger uh, error rate, but you can, these are sort of the same. Um, so right, if we consider the effect of noise on denser lattices, uh, lattices with many short vectors, uh, you can see that the same amount of noise sort of like smooths out the discrete structure of the lattice uh, until eventually you have something that's very close to uniform over the space. In this case, even like maximum likelihood decoding isn't going to work for you um, to recover your message M, at least not with like any sort of useful probability. So uh, with this encoding approach in mind, here's the skeleton of um, the protocol that uh, sort of at this level, it's actually like the, the same as our protocol and the, the protocol under repair scheme Thotling, and we'll sort of like flesh out the differences later on. But um, here's, here's the, the pseudocode. So uh, our, our receiver is gonna start uh, by uh, sending either the basis for a sparse or a dense lattice, um, depending on, on what its bit is. And then the sender will encode its first message with respect to the primal and its second message with respect to the dual. And it'll just like return both of these encodings. Um, and then the receiver will decode with respect to the appropriate lattice um, and you know, we'll, we'll recover the correct message because we can see here, oh, if we, we sent a sparse lattice, then um, encoding with respect to the primal is like the, the right thing to do. It allows us to recover, but this, uh, this dual will be very dense because of the sort of reciprocal geometry um, and we won't actually be able to decode. So this is sort of like the idealized sketch of our protocol. Cool. So, um, the question then, like, is this actually, does this actually work, right? Uh, this, this is very much a sketch. And like, is, is the lossiness that we're guaranteed um, actually enough, right? Um, so yeah, what happens if we have a cheating receiver that sends some sort of weird lattice that isn't completely sparse or completely dense? Um, notably our 2D example from before, right? We were sparse in one direction, dense in another. And so 
neither the problem with the dual is really like completely lost for us. Um, and this is where our work um, departs from that of uh, Bukowski and Dotling. Uh, so we turn to algebraically structured lattices to guarantee some amount of polarization in the number of short vectors um, and therefore also the density of the lattices used for, for lossy encryption. Um, so we work over rings of integers of cyclotomic number fields. Uh, for simplicity, we can just restrict ourselves to power of two cyclotomics. Um, and we recall that these modules embed as a lattice uh, in Zn under the coefficient embedding, uh, where we just take an element of, of the ring and embed it as a vector by like writing down its, uh, its polynomial coefficients. So given a matrix B over elements of R, uh, we can define the QRE module lattice as the lattice embedding um, of the module generated uh, by B, by the um, elements of B, uh, modulo Q. So this is going to be uh, a lattice that's periodic modulo Q. Um, crucially for us, uh, it's the case that these QRE module lattices um, over, over R um, of dimension N are uh, guaranteed if they have like a short vector to have n of them. Um, so like specifically, the, the lengths of its n shortest linearly independent vectors um, are all going to be the same. Again, n here is the sort of dimension of our, of our ring uh, that the module's over. Um, so this means we can't fall into some case where we only have like one or two short vectors in our lattice, um, and therefore only sparse in like a couple directions, or like only dense in a couple directions, I should say. Um, there will be either no short vectors in our lattice, or there will be at least n of them. Um, we're not quite guaranteed a, a full rank of short vectors here, um, so we will have to take some additional steps to ensure one of the two messages is com uh, completely statistically hidden in the setting. So um, now that we know a little bit more um, about module lattices, we get to like, fill out some more of the details um, of, uh, of our protocol. So right here, again, where uh, the receiver is going to send a basis for either a sparse or a dense, uh, now our module lattice. And um, right, so rather, uh, now, now we have to do something a little bit fancy, right? So we um, don't want to rely on the encoding directly for lossiness in the case where our input lattice might be dense. Um, so we're instead going to encode um, not the message itself, but um, uh, a random vector that we're then going to use as input to a randomness extractor. And we're going to use the output of that randomness extractor as a, as a like, random mask for our message. Um, this will allow recovery of the message whenever decoding is actually feasible, because we can just um, decode. Uh, you know, we're going to reveal the encoding, and so we can, we can decode the input to the randomness extractor and then just rerun it ourselves. Um, but if we weren't able to decode, um, but we didn't have, uh, like, that our message was completely statistically hidden, we only had some sort of, like, good min entropy guarantee for our encoding, that's still going to be enough for our purposes. So um, we'll, we'll be good in this case. And then here we haven't really changed what we're, uh, what we're doing with the, the other message. Um, we just sort of, you know, have this uh, non-formalized encoding algorithm that we're running on it with respect to the dual lattice. Well, so to show privacy, or at least to show statistical sender privacy, uh, we need to prove that either M0 is statistically hidden, uh, which requires that the conditional min entropy of X, given its encoding, is large, um, or M1 is statistically hidden um, by our like, underspecified encoding procedure. Uh, so to formalize the, the lossiness of encoding, um, we're going to restate the procedure in a way that enables us to use known regularity lemmas for module lattices. Um, yeah, so um, we denote by a row of lambda the, the total mass of a Gaussian function that falls on our lattice lambda. Um, so you just sort of like sum up all the Gaussian masses on all points on our lattice. Um, and we'll want to make use of this like a uh, weird quantity, this moving parameter of a lattice, um, which is the smallest real number s such that Gaussian with parameter uh, 1 over s places weight less than one plus epsilon on the dual lattice. Um, uh, 
as intuitive as I'm sure that definition is, perhaps more usefully, it can also be thought of as the minimum parameter of the Gaussian that smooths the discrete structure of lambda um, to an epsilon of uniformity. So we sort of saw this earlier with our like progression of um, you know, increasingly large error on the lattice. At some point, we're going to uh, end up with something that's like just uniform over the whole space. And that's uh, also what this, this parameter is capturing. So a uh, large smoothing parameter means that the lattice is sparse in at least one direction. And a uh, small smoothing parameter means the lattice is dense in all directions. It's uh, maybe a useful thing to, to observe. Um, in their uh, Ring at Learning with Errors toolkit paper, Lubyshevsky, Pikert, and Rykev uh, show that for generators B, the Lonto lattice, if a vector x is drawn from a discrete Gaussian with parameter sigma, which is greater than um, q times the smoothing parameter of the dual lattice, um, then the matrix vector product of um, the these sort of like basis uh, vectors, these generators, I guess, uh, and uh, this Gaussian vector x will be epsilon close to uniform. Um, so, right, so it's sort of saying like if we had some fixed amount of error and our dual lattice had a, um, a small smoothing parameter, uh, then we could sort of like sample from this fixed error distribution um, and be guaranteed to get uh, an output that's close to uniformly random by just computing this um, matrix vector product here. And this is what we're going to use then uh, as our encoding method uh, and take the results as a sort of approximately uniformly random mask for a message. So if lambda has no short vectors, um, it's sparse everywhere, uh, it's dual is dense everywhere, and so has small smoothing parameter and the regularity lemma can be applied. Um, on the other hand, if, uh, if lambda has um, any short vectors, then we know from this sort of like structure of our module lattice that it also has n of them, right? So um, this is gonna give us some sort of uh, min entropy guarantee or conditional min entropy guarantee um, for, uh, x or a random vector, even in the presence of its encoding. Um, so uh, we'll give a sort of like a proof sketch of that. And let me just like remind you again of what our encoding method is. Um, we're going to sample some sort of random vector x uh, as well as a, a discrete Gaussian. And we're going to use our random vector x to select a lattice point. We're going to perturb it, um, make it mod q. Um, and then this is uh, this input x is what we're going to give to our, our randomness extractor, um, and then uh, we'll also send to the the receiver this uh, encoding y, right? So what we want to show is that x sort of in the presence of y still has uh, high min entropy. Um, so a similar proof technique. Uh, as that's shown in uh, GD18 can be applied, and we're gonna sort of sketch it briefly here. Um, well, so uh, imagine I guess like maximum likelihood decoding of x given y, because E is drawn from the Gaussian, the most likely x given y is the one that minimizes E. Um, so this like, just immediately means that the most likely x is the lattice point that's closest to the um, encoding y. Um, and this also sort of means that uh, the error vector must have fallen in the Voronoi cell of the lattice. Um, however, if our lattice has many short vectors, uh, many linearly independent short vectors, then the probability that our error vector fell in the Voronoi cell can't actually be too large, um, right? So in this case, there are like many densely packed shifts with the Voronoi cell along some subspace that also capture significant amounts of Gaussian mass. Um, and so there's not going to be like too much mass concentrated just in the Voronoi cell. Quantitatively, we can bound the probability of E falling in the Voronoi cell by like inverse exponential in N. Um, and this suffices to show that X must have high conditional min entropy given Y. Um, and so that's, that's statistical center privacy right there. Um, computational receiver privacy ultimately follows um, from pseudo randomness of LWE. Uh, because we can uh, use, you know, the LWE uh, generation for our uh, keys for our lossy encryption system. Um, and so that's it for privacy. We put the, the sender and the receiver. So um, to summarize, uh, we present a, uh, an efficient statistically sender private oblivious transfer protocol uh, from our module lattices. 
um, we use the structure of these lattices to get improvements of efficiency that sort of exceed what you would um, like immediately expect from moving to these more structured lattices. Um, and we still like do get this communication overhead though, right? We get like a, a log lambda, like lambda is your security parameter, communication overhead um, for communication between the sender and the receiver um, compared to the actual like bits of information that, that are being exchanged. Um, so a sort of open question is, is there any way we can drive this down? Is there any way to like actually get like constant overhead? Like that would be a really appealing uh, next goal. So thank you very much again for, for sticking around and I hope to see you at the conference.